Hello, everybody. My name is Krishan the Don, and I am misinformed. NBC News defends We're Coming for Your Children chant at New York City Drag March, arguing it's been used for years at Pride events. NBC asserted that the drag marchers were saying, We're here, we're queer, we're not going shopping. And that it's only one voice that is louder than the crowd who said, we're coming for your children. Which is a complete lie because we heard the video. You can hear it clearly. There's multiple people saying. We're here. We're here. We're now, in that part of the article, NBC was actually quoting the organizer of the drag march, which is a man by the name of Brian Griffin. Now, Brian Griffin admits that. His organization has chanted this and chanted other obscene things as he puts a way to basically own the slurs. And when they say slurs, they mean this connection that the LGBTQ plus community has to pedophilia. But I'm going to show you in a bit, contrary to the numerous fact checks that you'll find that claim this is just another debunked right wing extremist conspiracy theory. I'm going to prove to you that it's actually historically and undisputedly a fact that the LGBTQ activists had and still have a strong connection to pedophilia. In fact, their entire movement is based on pedophilia. Now, this is not a disclaimer, but I just want to make sure I'm very clear. In this video, I'm not talking about gay people. I'm talking about the LGBTQ movement, and I'm talking about the activists specifically. However, if you're still offended by anything I say, just understand that everything that I say is fact, and I'm just the messenger. I'm not the one you should be angry with. So in order for me to connect the dots, which honestly isn't really that hard to do, I'm going to first have to explain to you who Brian Griffin is and what organization he's a part of. Brian Griffin, an activist who performs as Harmony Moore, Organized the first New York City drag march in 1994. It's fun. It's about performance, Griffin said. A leaderless group of activists with the radical fairies. <laughs> now you might think that's a silly name, huh? The radical fairies. But this is where things get really interesting. So the Radical Fairies was this gay activist group that was created to basically be the gay version of counterculture, this the 1960s counterculture. And it was founded by a man named Henry Harry Hay Jr. So I'm, I'm, I am at present involved in what is known as the Radical Fairy Movement. So basically the Radical Fairies was one of the groups that were responsible for making the LGBTQ movement as explicit as it is today. When I had been an outlaw sexually all my life anyway, so to move from the legal position of outlaw to a position of outlaw sexuality on an open basis mm -hmm. was just that not that much of a step. The radical fairies felt like the gay movements at that time were only not being explicit because they were trying to what they would call adhere to hetero norms or basically trying to make heterosexual people feel comfortable. Minute message for young lesbians and gay men today. Harry? Yes, I would. I would suggest, among other things, that we must begin to quit imitating the heteros as much as we do. And I think as far as the younger people are concerned, they've got a big step up on all of us. The Radical Fairies was a movement that was created to normalize sexual taboos and basically to own the debauchery. That's why their name sounds like a gay slur that R.G. Bunker would use. If you don't know, buddy, I'll spell it out for you. F-A-G fruit. <laughs> Because to them, calling it debauchery is just adhering to quote-unquote hetero norms. In other words, to them, it's not really debauchery. In fact, there is no such thing as debauchery. So, fast forward to them now chanting is exactly on course and in line with the mission of the group's origins. I've always said that we should tear off the ugly green frog skin and find the beautiful fairy prince underneath, and I hope all the young ones find the beautiful fairy prince tomorrow. When gay people asked them to tone it down with the leather and the fetish stuff back in the 70s, they actually dialed it up, just like they're doing now. And back then, their approach actually won the gay culture, which is why now you're seeing the over-the-top pride parades and the dancing naked in the streets and the leather and the bondage. 
and uh, displaying their kinks in public. And now in 2023, they're still challenging the more conservative gay movements. They're challenging groups like the Gays Against Groomers because to them, the word groomer is actually a homophobic slur because to them, they believe grooming is a thing that should be normalized. They see the anti-pedophilia culture as a hetero norm that needs to be changed. Now, Henry Hay Jr. wasn't only an LGBTQ activist. He was considered and still is considered one of the pioneers of the LGBTQ movement. He was also a Marxist and a communist. And also, he was an advocate for NAMBLA. NAMBLA, if you're not familiar, means the North American Man-Boy Love Association. Basically, NAMBLA is an organization that advocates for pedophilia. In general, there are lots of boys that precisely want to do that. They make it clear, and they simply do it. They what don't. Is it? That is to uh, give a blowjob. That's what to give the head, as the saying goes. That's what they want to do, and they do it. This is a documentary that was made about NAMBLA in 1994. But I wanted to show you a clip of this just to show you the mentality of a member from NAMBLA. This is Leland Stevenson, who at the time of this documentary was the NAMBLA secretary. So what happened? What? You made the phone ring. Oh, you made the phone ring? Oh, well, let's see how you did that. Oh, jeez. You're just very recording. No, no. Do this again. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Zero. Hey, not bad. You answer it. Hey, how can I get the secret? Dial 660 and the next phone number will be Cool. 660 and the phone number is The last four digits of that phone number. Of that phone. 660 plus the last four digits of that yeah. phone. And that'll do it. Yep. Yeah, but you Very can't good. anybody out. Oh, yeah, goodness. Okay. Yeah. That'll, that'll be our secret then. No, that's the hot radio. He was so eager to tell me when his birthday was, and he was going to be 15 in less than a month on the 1st of December, and uh, this is what life is about. This is what real life is about. Now, in this one little clip, you can see just how perverted and, and really delusional these people are. He takes this really harmless interaction and casual interaction and reads it as a sexual advance from a child. I would say that he was in bloom, and that's it. The flower is uh, responding to warmth. That is, I as a human being am bathing him in a certain kind of celestial warmth, and he feels that, and he responds to that, and he thinks, oh, how nice, how wonderful that there's someone there who is appreciating what I am and who I am. Now, I want you to keep in mind the mentality of this ghoulish piece of garbage that you're watching and how it made your skin crawl and the goosebumps that popped up. Because you're going to see actually how this line of thought is what created the LGBTQ movement. So, so far, we've only gone two degrees of separation and we've already hit pedophilia. Not only that, we can see that the LGBTQ movement to come for your children reaches as far back as 1979. You're talking about the gay lifestyle uh, to, uh, to students of about oh, three or four hundred of them at the time. After reading Alfred Kinsey's sexual behavior in the human male in 1948, Hay developed the goal of organizing the disparate homosexuals of America to elicit public change. So Henry Hay was directly inspired by Alfred Kinsey. Now, if you don't know who Alfred Kinsey is, Kinsey is the guy who basically is credited as the man who launched the sexual revolution. If you talk to any left-wing commie, most of them will tell you that he's some kind of brave pioneer or some kind of genius revolutionary. The Kinsey's legacy will really allow individual to create that a safe space for them to explore their sexuality. To continue to be a pioneer, to continue to ask difficult questions. And honestly, the furthest criticism that you'll get from the left on Alfred Kinsey is that he's controversial or he's polarizing. You might also recognize his name from something called the Kinsey scale. I'm like, you guys know what the Kinsey scale is? Yeah. Which, if you heard any LGBTQ activists speak, it's the basis of their entire movement. 
The Kinsey Scale is an idea developed by Alfred Kinsey in 1948. Kinsey and colleagues interviewed over 5,000 people and the result was the Kinsey Scale. Which is the idea that everybody's sexual identity or sexual preference is based on a spectrum. So the Kinsey Scale in its most basic form is basically a rectangle split into six. Half of it is sort of gray and the other half is white. And so it shows basically how much of each attraction you have. Zero is that you're entirely heterosexual and sex is entirely homosexual desires. The other numbers in between, so five, four, three, two, and one, are all on what I would call the bisexual spectrum. Honestly, a bunch of goofy, commie, woke horseshit that nobody really understands, but everybody pretends they really care about. It sounds like some fucking commie gobbledygook. <sighs> Now, you might also recognize the name Kinsey from the Kinsey Institute, which he created. What we're committed to is understanding the rich diversity of sexuality that exists throughout the world and to do it in a way that is fearless, honest, genuine, non-judgmental findings and interpretation of those findings is what we have done so well for the last 75 years. And it's what I hope we will continue to do for many years to come. Now, it's really interesting how the guy from the Kinsey Institute worded that, right? Non-judgmental findings. Word of advice, people. If a guy like this ever tells you not to be judgmental about his research, you should probably be judgmental about his research. So let's take a look at all the findings of Alfred Kinsey. We have a whole chapter here in which children have been tortured for this so-called scientific data. And this is the calculations of those abuse data into tables to promote this as scientific to the world. An assessment of these data suggests that at minimum 317, at maximum 1,200 and some boys were being sexually raped around the clock using stopwatches. So Alfred Kinsey had all these theories or, in my opinion, fantasies about child sexuality and one of his theories, which actually was the theory that he put most of the work into, go figure, was that human beings were sexual beings from birth, that children were sexual beings. But he needed the data and the research to back up his claims. But to conduct the experiments that it would take to get this data was illegal, obviously, and unethical even at that time. It was illegal, and we knew it was illegal. But uh, so it's very important for people to study childhood sexuality. So Alfred Kinsey did the next best thing. He secretly recruited pedophiles and encouraged them to continue raping children. Then he would have them record accurate details of the abuse in diaries, which they would hand over to Kinsey, and Kinsey would use those diaries as research for his book. He would also protect their identity, keep all their crimes a secret, and give them tips on how to avoid the police. Not only that, he taught the pedophiles how to accurately record details in a scientific way to make his research more thorough. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, not only is the data and research in his book based on child rapes that he encouraged and really only made possible by aiding and abetting sexual predators, the reason why his work is considered pseudoscience is because it's also recorded in the perspective and at the discretion of the pedophile. Let me explain. So, for example, in Kinsey's book, there's data that claims that infants had orgasms while being molested. It, it was an absurd page in science. But to actually stand there with a stopwatch and have somebody or oneself stimulate uh, the infant and time it to the split second was simply uh, so gross that I didn't, uh, I didn't feel it, it, it had a place in a, in, in a scientific book. Now, Rex Green was probably one of Kinsey's most well-known patients. I put that in quotations because in reality, Rex Green was just a prolific pedophile, child rapist, child molester. And with no independent corroboration, he published verbatim Green's detailed descriptions of what the pedophile claimed were orgasms experienced by the hundreds of children he had abused. In Rex Green's diaries, he detailed how when he raped very young children that the children would scream during penetration, so he would count that as pleasure or an orgasm. Extreme tension with violent convulsion, 
often involving the sudden heaving and jerking of the whole body, groaning, sobbing, or more violent cries, sometimes with an abundance of tears, especially among younger children. If you read those words, what he's talking about is kids who are screaming, kids who are protesting in every way they can the fact that their bodies, that their persons are being violated. Uh, the individual in question, uh, I think, uh, harmed uh, in serious ways uh, a large number of young people. When in reality, if a child is screaming during a rape, only a sadistic, delusional rapist pedophile would see that as an expression of pleasure. I would say that he was in bloom, and that's it. The flower is uh, responding to warmth. So in reality, the genius left-wing hero that started the sexual revolution and directly inspired the LGBTQ movement, you know, the people that base everything they know about sex on Kinsey's work, actually did nothing more than enable the delusions of a prolific pedophile. For this case, like Green, and uh, so he, he, had a, he contributed a fair amount to our knowledge of and when I say our knowledge, I mean no, medi medicine's knowledge of sexuality and children. And by the way, all that data, all that research, all the charts, all the tables, all the facts and figures were all published in a book called The Sexual Behavior in the Human Male. The book that's credited for launching the sexual revolution and the same book that directly inspired LGBTQ hero and known pedophile advocate Henry Hay Jr. I hope all the young ones find the beautiful fairy prince tomorrow. Can't you see? They can't have their LGBT youth. They can't have their trans youth movement. The LGBTQ wouldn't exist today if it wasn't for the work of Alfred Kinsey. They wouldn't have their sexual spectrum to arrogantly point at as if it wasn't created by a sociopathic pedophile. As if we're just too stupid to realize what they're really trying to do. Intellectualize and justify their illegal sexual activities. Non-judgmental findings. But it makes sense. They're just having fun. Carrying out the legacy of Rex King and Nazi pedophiles under the intellectual cover of Alfred Kinsey clouded by the message of Henry Hay Jr. under the fun, exciting rainbow banner of the LGBTQ movement. I guess ignorance really is bliss. So in order for them to have their sexual revolution, all they had to do was ignore the thousands of child rapes that made it possible to make their fake science palatable to the public. We decided very early that all we needed to do, we had learned a lot by this time from the progressive movements, that all we needed to do was to create a facade. Yeah. And then behind the facade, we could organize. It became that facade, and it seemed to be built of solid marble, pink marble, of course, but <laughs> nevertheless, solid marble, and then behind that, we would organize. And what was wonderful about it is the moment the people felt that that facade was in place and they were safe, they, they overcame their fear and they turned out in droves. Now, you may realize that NBC is actually right. They're telling the truth. They are coming for your children. In fact, they've been coming for the children for so long that the original children they were coming for now have grandchildren. They came for your grandparents, they came for your parents, they came for you, now they're coming for your children. You might be watching this right now and you might be gay. And you might be thinking, well, I'm, I'm part of the LGBTQ movement, but not that part of it. Only you probably say it way more dramatic and flamboyant than I just did. Now, if you're that person, there's something you got to think about. There may have been a time in American history that gay people were persecuted for their sexuality. I'm not going to deny that. But you got to understand, there are some people in this world that should be persecuted for their sexuality. And if you watch this video, you know who those people are. So you got to ask yourself, why are you still fighting for sexual liberation when you already have it? You're fighting for the sexual liberation of people who don't have it. And the only people who don't have sexual liberation in this country are pedophiles. Misfit. Nation. Misfit.